We are a hub for the world. If you can connect road, rail, sea and air in a seamless movement, then you've got to be beating the competitor to the marketplace. Jamaica is a major player in the Caribbean being the second largest economy in CARICOM, but also the second largest population. It also has a lot of competition on multiple fronts. Can you go through the different comparative advantages of the country, but also the ways it can still get better in the near future? Well, what sets Jamaica apart right now from the world is our location close to the equator. This is a just-in-time world which means that you must move goods and services and people to where they want to be, when they want to be there. And by that, you open up niche markets too and move away just from mass production, which itself carries a great deal of issues over the years. So Jamaica has been recognized in the world that we move goods and services two to four days earlier than any other country by the closeness of to the equator. Therefore, our job is to create an integrated multimodal transport plan because we have the second oldest railway in the world. So that basically, if you can connect road, rail, sea and air in a seamless movement, then you've got to be beating the competitor to the marketplace and opening up the hub concept of moving goods and services. In terms of goods, we have the facilities with the ports at the moment and every port is connected to the railway at the moment. And then by extension now, what we need to do is recognize that the two airports we have are below sea level. And if climate change is a reality, we must now build out a large airport that can take the larger economic-sized planes that carry both cargo and persons to reach the rest of the world in a just-in-time mode. The basic point is where we are. We are a hub for the world. And therefore, you can fly north, south, east or west. You can get it back across. Now, if you want to historically relate that, where I'm offering to build the Vernon Field Development Project, this was an old air base which was existed and has five runways already. This was where, before the United Nations was formed, Eleanor Roosevelt arrived into Jamaica when they were looking at trying to say whether they rebuild Europe or whether they build a core element for delivery across the world, across the world overall. So this offers the potential to link the four elements of transport and be able to let us now take the A380, which is the largest plane, because the economic of flying demands an economy of scale. You know, 4,000, 7,000 on ship, 12,000 on ship, 4,000 on planes overall. But we do not have the capacity in Jamaica to accept those long-haul flights. And my analysis on the open skies, which is what I am articulating for the development of Vernon Field, nobody who lives in India, which is now traveling more than any other country, China, Malaysia, Thailand, Middle East, Far East, Africa, North America, South, uh, sorry, South America, can travel without getting a visa through Europe or through the United States. If you open up that market, then you can see what that's going to drive with the hotels. You can see what's going to happen to drive with the employment level that spin offs from that overall. And remember that basically the smaller islands themselves will never be able to take the larger planes. So that's when the hub for the Caribbean context will come. And we're on our way with the Ian Fleming Airport to be expanded and developed as another hub for the Caribbean. The way we have to start to do better is firstly not build from the top down, but equally from the bottom up. Therefore, what I'm speaking to is that every in development plan, every investment should bear in mind how you integrate the unemployed and, and employable within the structure of the development and by that extension ensure the country shares, not in a 50-year cycle of development, but beyond that. Because unless we grow the economy, then we may just end up building enclave investments which will not move the country in the direction in which it really should go, nor raise the level of the, the lifestyle of the people. And therefore, I have to build out opportunities for the mass of the population which have been left behind over the years. And so Jamaica has had an unstable economic growth over the past few years, but some sectors such as tourism are working fairly well. As transport minister and, and mining minister as well, of course, 
what can you say about perhaps investment opportunities that are less well known to people outside of Jamaica that that have the potential to be attractive for foreign direct investment? Well, well one or two spring immediately to mind. Number one is bunkering facilities. If you're going to increase the shipping industry, you have to begin to have the bunkering facilities and the support mechanisms for the shipping industry. I targeted when I was minister in the past, the maritime industry, which I moved the registration of people attending CMI from 300 to 3,000 before I left to go to 6,000 with a 98% placement across the globe. I'm doing the same with the Vernon Field Development Project with the aerospace industry. Because, for instance, the MRO of aeroplanes has to go all the way to Europe to be repaired. And therefore, I'm moving that to be located on the Vernon Field Development Project, which is being done on the open skies, to be able to develop another area of investment that is important to development. And Jamaica has just opened a brand new highway connecting the, the north and south coasts, which in addition to the fact that it's convenient, of course, for the, the citizens of Jamaica and for the tourists, it's also extremely convenient for businesses, for industry, to move their, their raw material and their products more efficiently and a lot faster, which is, which as you highlighted, is crucial. When we were building that north-south highway, we deliberately made land available to create economic zones along the highway to both attract traffic and to incorporate the people who live in the area. So the basic aspect of it is when we build those economic zones, we must seek to build joint venture projects. For instance, if you're going to encourage Chinese investment and development, there are small Chinese companies who may be interested in bottling, relabeling, remarketing their product. And marketing is merely a matter of brand registration and getting it there just in time. Where Jamaica is placed, we can move goods from the Central and South America into the European market quicker than anyone else. So that basically is by utilizing that. My vision is you arrive at the Kingston Container Terminal, you offload the container onto the train, the train goes straight into Vernon Field and then goes onto the plane. And all of that will be done because the rail time between Kingston, which exists as we speak, to Vernon Field, where I'm building the major airport for the future, means that, basically, you can deliver goods coming from the Far East whatever time the ship or the plane gets, and it can be in the tables of New York and Europe within 10, 12 hours. And what are the specific improvements in infrastructure that you plan to do in, in the next five years? Well, the infrastructure is at the moment, as you mentioned, the highways connect, and the highways are meant to improve that more quickly. Then, therefore, now the railway is being rehabilitated as we speak. We have an investment offer from the United States from a company called Herzog, and we're working through that process. Now, the railway offers five forms of investment. It offers cargo, persons, heritage, and now with the LNG investment that is taking place, we are therefore going to be able to also need it for it to move that kind of cargo as bauxite, and we are looking to expand as bauxite declines, we have to look at limestone, we have to look at the rare earth elements, we have to look at all the various side products that would have been, and we have the, one of the best limestone in the world. So it's merely a matter of implementing another issue, another form of production on the, the issues we already have working for us. You mentioned bauxite. The cost of energy in Jamaica is so expensive that refining that bauxite on site is very costly for Jamaica and, and makes it less competitive as an international product. How can you address that issue as Transport and Mining Minister? Well, the idea of that is being addressed by me very actively through two elements. Number one, the investment in LNG is supposed to drive the energy costs down overall. Secondly, there are, very, there are areas of energy that can be created around the bauxite companies themselves. What is happening is that the, the, the price internationally, our labor costs and our production costs have been higher than it should, not just from energy, but from our own our costs on the ground, that it isn't as profitable as it should be for the expansion to grow. What I'm doing is I have offers to look at is to look at countries that may be interested to be more investing now in the byproducts of that in as much as there's bauxite and doing an integrated development around each of the plants. And we have to build against a 30-year decline because your resources in bauxite are maybe just 30 years. 
but I expect a resurgence in that tied to other industries that could form part of the bauxite industry structure. I believe one of those byproducts would be rare earth elements, which are found That's in right. abundance in the red mud. But at the moment, the market for Jamaican red mud has been put on hold. Can you explain to us why that, that has been the case and what it would take for Jamaica to fully take advantage of that opportunity? Whatever it is, I've already activated interest overseas to revive that interest. As you know, I think the Japanese came and did an investment after the last government, and that has halted at the moment. I'm reassessing that position, and I'm expecting to have some interest expressed from the Middle East in that area of development. And I'm looking at outside markets of the non-traditional ones that we have dealt with in relation of encouraging that. And I have got good response on the rare earth elements and what should flow from that. I myself, when I was first minister, was using the red mud with a certain, a certain other element to create roads for farm areas. And um, that is going to be re-examined as to what took place. The issue with it at the time was that um, the bauxite uses a lot of chlorine and that kind of thing, and that has to be analyzed. I don't know how far we've reached with that, and that's what I'm researching right now. Do you have an idea of the scale of that market if it were to be exploited? Maybe? The scale of the market is very, very good overall. The exact amount I don't have before me in relation to it. But the, what is very clear to me is the fact that bauxite could only have made the impact it made by the use of the railway. So it's kept the railway alive because any, any elements of that kind of raw material needs cheap transport to get it to the point of the international outreach. So the revival of the railway is going to be very important to that. This is your second time as uh, Minister of Transport, before it was Minister of Transport and Works. Can you tell us what you've learned from and since your, your, your term in 2011? And are there projects that you had at the time that you would wish to continue in this term? And are there new ideas that you hadn't thought at the time that you... Basically, what have I learned? I've learned that when you push hard enough, you're saying so many things that everything can come at all end, right? I usually start my meetings that I'm an old man in a hurry, so I'm intending to implement tomorrow what should have been done yesterday immediately. So on the basis of that overall, I have learned that now I can move more quickly because I'm picking up the pieces having come back into the ministry. Because what I left was an integrated multimodal plan which spoke to how I revived the bus in the service on the road. Um, the North-South Highway and this first Chinese Development Bank investment was what I created and followed up on overall. I protected the Palisades shoreline in order to save the Palisades. But I now can do what I want, which is the Vernon Field Development Project. I can now go back to reviving the railway, which I did without any central government support overall. And I can now move to look at the other issues socially which have to be addressed on the transport. But if I develop the Vernon Field project, then I'm aiming to have an airdrome bigger than any other in the world. And in that context overall, one can see the outgrowth that that would create in the economy. It's an investment of, to begin with, of about two to three billion US dollars. We already have interest being expressed from more than one area. We have the document and the issues and the tier development in place. Um, I remind everyone, Vernon Field is larger than Manhattan. And therefore, if you think high, you will appreciate what I'm speaking about in that development plan. And I can also begin to lift the social level of transport. Because what I have in mind is to ensure that we develop the road network in terms of taxes and vehicles to a level where the person who is now involved in it, can rely on it as being a part of his income and a strength position. So you're not leasing routes for seven months, but for five years or whatever is the period that we're going to put in place. So I'm picking up those pieces and the Portmore hub that's to come was part of that vision of how you move people from a taxi service to a bus service to a rail service. Those are issues that I expect to achieve in two to three years. In 1976, so 40 years ago this year, you were the first Jamaican politician to be shot while campaigning. Despite that, you become one of the longest public servants in Jamaican history. 
I was wondering if you've ever at the time considered to step away from politics and, um, and what has changed in those 40 years in Jamaican politics? If I must be very honest with you, not a lot has changed as much as it should for the social levels of my country. In fact, I published my a book called Many Rivers to Cross, which started my first speech in Parliament in 1980. And it spoke to the ills of the need of water, infrastructure, and social issues that should be addressed. I could go back to Parliament and make the same appeal as I speak to you now. So I'm very disappointed in that development in terms of the infrastructure. I blame that on a lack of planning that relates to our country overall. Mm -hmm. um, so basically, however, what has changed are opportunities too at the same time, which have improved. What I think we need more is an integrated social development too. So if you're coming into Vernon Field as I'm offering it, then you have to build the town around you. Because if you want to speak to that in Bauxite, we don't have a Bauxite town. The people have nothing to show for what is their earth that you have moved. Eh? So on that basis, I am tying into the investment structure, a social plan that relates to dealing with the issues that surround Take the railway. People have squatted on the lines. That has to be a challenge. But in that challenge, I must take the railway land and begin to create the housing that relates to how you build the heritage tourism around that railway. And wherever there are major railway meetings, we can build economic zones that incorporates the vendor to begin with. Because if I'm going to bring the visitor or tourist along to that area, then certainly the people who make the change, the bees or whatever you, authentically, will have a marketplace and be part of the growth pattern. That is what I'm hoping will change things. And that is why it is important for me, in any issue of investment I'm looking at, to make sure it's not an enclave investment, one that isolates the people from the actual development that they see around them. And in addition to having been transport minister twice, You've also been, let me get this right, you've also been youth minister twice. You've been minister of information, of culture. You've been deputy leader and later chairman of the JLP. That's quite a long career. Congratulations. So what accomplishments in that time are you most proud of? And uh, what were the biggest challenges? If I started with culture, the first one would be the removing of any duty on instruments being brought in by persons in the performing arts. Okay, and the naming of the production and training center, which I called the Creative Production Training Center, which was meant to deal with the creative elements of the persons. They should have used that to produce plays because we haven't transitionalized to use our written word to be made into the film aspect of interpretation. So I'd be proud of that aspect that I did in that part. I preached long ago that tourism should never be built on sun, sea, and sand. It should be built on food, music, drama, dance. And therefore, that should be the element that draw people to us overall. And the extent to which I have been involved in sports, I've ended up owning one of the fourth largest soccer clubs in Jamaica at the moment. And that helps to build communities overall. So I'm proud of that in many ways. I have um, integrated community development projects that are showing out and throwing out persons to the creative element of the world. And um, in terms of information, I've sought to ensure that I inform the people of what we're trying to do. My greatest fight is reparations, okay, um, which I notice very few people will recall very often. But I believe we need to be, have the slaves paid what was paid to the slave owners. And that would relieve a lot of the issues that we have in terms of it. In terms of Ministry of Transport or Works, um, the Jamaica development program that I brought, I can think, you know, when I came in, Falmouth cruise ship here was merely a concept on paper. I finished it in two years, and it's, it's contributed greatly to the growth of tourism. The Rio Grande Bridge, the longest bridge in Jamaica, the Christiana Development Road, the Portland, um, the Palisades Shoreline Protection over, that was built, the Ian Fleming Airport, which I'm now going to move to the next level, because we're going to extend the runway to make sure we accommodate the American Eagle and the Delta Embraer that you can feed from there into that area and develop the Port Antonia area. 
So I've tried to be as rounded in my approach as possible. I have preached long ago for, I hear of the ganja industry, I preached long ago that it should never have been illegal to begin with and that it was an important element of the faith of Rastafari and should be so recognized that our country has failed to recognize our Afrocentricity. So we shy away from ourselves in relation to that. So that basically those are areas I still pursue and with a great deal of satisfaction overall. I can't say I enjoyed being shot, but you know, that's, that was par for the course at the time anyway. We'd like to thank Minister Michael Henry for his time. This is the second interview in our series about Jamaica. You can click on the link at the end of the video to see our interview with Prime Minister Andrew Holness. And there will be more interviews in the coming weeks and months with leaders not only in the Caribbean, but in many other countries where World Investment News is currently working. For more information, you can head to our website, www.wine.com. That's W-I-N-N-E for World Investment News. For our Caribbean reports, you can head to caribbean.wine.com. And to go straight to our Jamaica report, you can go to jamaica.wine.com. You can also follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn to stay up to date with World Investment News. And of course, please subscribe to our YouTube channel for more video content. For World Investment News, I'm Stan Arn. Thanks for watching.